I am from Baroda and I moved to Mumbai in 1998 after I finished my studies. And uh, my mom is from Bombay. So I used to visit the city as to my nanny's house and I would be very comfortable and it was a very safe zone. So we would go shopping, we would go eating, we would kind of come home in a car. So when I moved to Mumbai in 1998, my husband and I, we didn't have enough money. And I didn't want to depend on my nanny house or my mother and all. So we were really struggling. And the Bombay I had in mind that time, the safe, the very sophisticated, the very fun loving one, suddenly changed into a nightmare for me. Because suddenly I started facing this identity crisis as an individual in the city. And now the city has its own um, process of rejecting and accepting you. And that kind of became um, a source of my work for me. Uh, I didn't have money, so I couldn't buy much of the materials. I didn't have space, so I used to work on a small table. Um, so all those things you kind of see in the work and their relationship to the elements in the work will be seen very clearly when I discuss them. So just to start with, Place them. Um, I kind of uh, uh, compose them in such a way that there's this infinite ladder going up to the painting, and uh, the white is kind of signify the bad side of me, and the colorful one. Uh, the, sorry, the white is the pure me, and the colorful one is the bad side of me. So there's conflict between the two, and eventually uh, the bad one wins. So it was almost like a sign for me to change from the kind of person that I was and kind of start becoming smart and start changing yourself. Coming from a small town that, that became like a very crucial change for me as a human being. Uh, as I said, you know, we didn't have enough money. We did not have many sources so we were kind of staying in rented homes. And the city on one side was kind of playing its own character of exception and rejection with you. Uh, one of his law for um, sense of belonging somewhere was there in, the, in, in life that time. And you know, we used to listen a lot to uh, Tracy Chapman and her song, I Have a Feeling That I Belong. And it would probably play, play 20 times in my house that day because that was the only record we had and we would just keep listening to the FM and then go back to work. Yeah. And uh, through her songs, actually, a lot of my work got defined. And one of the songs which, which really did it was this one, I Have a Feeling That I Belong, where I'm kind of overlooking the city uh, with the landscape hitting a backdrop. And it's, it's quasi, it looks like a terrace drop, or it could be staring into a swimming pool, which has this image of the city behind. So it's almost like playing the politics of the city again. Yeah. Um, we used to shift a lot, like if we found a rent cheaper than the previous one, we would move homes and we would shift immediately to that place. So, uh, you know, this was a title in between 413 414, where that time I was paying rupees 2800 as rent, uh, and 82403, where we paid 1800 rent. So, you know, it was quite chaotic for me as an artist, as a person to kind of shift back in baggage every six months to a cheaper place. And uh, you know, as you see, it starts coming in the work where I actually painted the spaces that I was living in or the kind of character they had or what they made me into when I'm kind of climbing out of the window to kind of disappear to some place which, is, which feels more safe or more like home. Um, 
I decided to show this painting, it's called Visitors. Um, when I started talking about my work, I said that my mom's from Bombay and I would visit Bombay very often as a visitor. And uh, I never really looked at other character of the city, where, which could be, I only saw the sacred, I never saw the profane, literally. And uh, when I moved to Mumbai, I actually lived in areas which were not very, um, very posh or not very, uh, they were really, uh, I'm sorry to use this word, but they were very lower middle class areas that, because those were the only ones we could afford. So uh, that kind of influenced a lot of my thinking that time about spaces, about architecture, about landscape, which you'll see later on when I'll show you the landscape works. So here is kind of an image of me flying over the city, almost in a very flippant manner, crossing over, but not realizing what is underneath, really, and looking at the layers of the city. Uh, in 1999, uh, when India and Pakistan were toying with the idea of launching their nuclear weapons, um, I at that time in my house was battling an entire army of cockroaches in my kitchen. And uh, really, I mean, you know, when one didn't have the means or the uh, money to do certain things, so I used to collect these cockroaches, you know, they would be dead, I would collect them and put them in a box and actually leave them out in the sun. And I thought, a cockroach has more brown tones than a chocolate does. So, you know, those were the certain things which would come to me as a, you know, as a creative person and I would kind of write those things down. Little did I know that very soon I was going to make an entire work with these cockroaches. And um, in 2000, when India and Pakistan were a point about launching their nuclear weapon, as a citizen, the question kind of comes back that, how important is this? Is it a security or is it a disaster? And how much of a say does an individual have as a democracy? And I was kind of researching about the nuclear weapons and all, and suddenly I come across this article that said, cockroaches will be the only survivors in the nuclear reactor. They will be the only ones who can survive the nuclear reactor because of their body type or the body built. And they haven't changed much in like said some two million years or something. And I was like, wow, this you know creamy, brown looking thing will probably over survive us if we die. And that kind of became a very poetic look to the idea of, I'm sure you all agree, a very ugly beast or <laughs> insect like cockroach and kind of comparing it with a nuclear weapon. So I thought, um, so what I decided, that, as I said, I didn't have money, so I was kind of looking at materials which could uh, allow me to create that cockroach. So what you see here is uh, not a real cockroach. Not even a single one is real, they're all handmade. And uh, the only material I could afford that time was MC. Because M seal has a character of clay. You know, it's malleable like clay, but only for 10 minutes. After that, it becomes hard like rock. So I kind of found the material I wanted to use. So I got the clay and I got the kiln. So I didn't have to go and fire anything. It would just dry on its own. And I could create the sculptures. So I very meticulously sat down from morning to night. In the beginning, very consciously, in between, like feeling like a factory worker, and by the end of it, ah, I finished 2,500 cockroaches. Now the process was like ranging from that emotion to uh, uh, to the triumph of creating all 2,500. And each one is really hand created by me. So somewhere in these, you'll actually see uh, my lines, which I've embedded in the clay. <laughs> And they, it works so well that it looked like the veins or the, the body type of a cockroach. So, this work is titled The Nymph and the Adult. Uh, the nymph is a baby cockroach and the adult is a full grown cockroach. And through this work I was kind of questioning the idea of nuclear war and nuclear weapon and how, uh, how trivial it becomes when you realize that you will probably die, but an insect which you want to kill in your kitchen will survive it. So it kind of started off a discussion on you know how 
the idea of nuclear weaponry or nuclear war, of all of the worlds is looked at. And since there were 2,500 of them, I decided to create a corner where I just infested them with these handmade cockroaches. So the impact was such that they would they look very realistic and when they were, they were clustered, people would feel it's an illusion, you know, it's an optical illusion where people say, someone would come and tell me, I saw one move. You know? So people really thought that they were real and they would not enter the world zone. They would not enter the area where they were displayed because they were really scared that they were, some, some of them were alive there. So, um, so just some details about the world. So we kind of stuck them on the ceiling, uh, on, uh, on the wall, under, under the flooring. Uh, I got calls from people who said, you know, I saw a cockroach in New York kitchen and, uh, you know, I didn't know there were cockroaches in the house. So one night I went to the kitchen and switched on the light and suddenly they all go, they just disappeared suddenly. You know? So the brown wall became suddenly white. So I think, for me, the work was successful. It wasn't just about me talking about kitchen insects to uh, someone that, something that I was scared of, to something I wanted to put it in, like a uh, whole relation to the nuclear war and, and the kind of imagery or the iconography uh, to a cockroach, uh, to something which was somebody probably saw it in their own kitchen and remember the work. So for me, the discussion starts there and it grows from there. So, uh, uh, that work was done in 2001, um, 99, 2000, 2001, 2, 3. These five years were, were years where I made art with, artwork with very cheap materials, something which was easily or freely available to me, where I didn't have to spend more than 1,000 rupees to make that artwork. And suddenly, uh, the scale started gaining a lot of importance for me that time because suddenly to kind of give a relevance to a very basic material and transform it into something extremely important became a process for me and you know how uh, like a cockroach which I probably made on my palm but I was scattered it on a wall which is like 50 feet wide to a flooring which is 50 feet long so suddenly the scale became extremely important in the work as well and in 2002 I got invited to a workshop in Mysore through coach and uh, uh, it was actually a resort, with the site was a resort uh, given to the artist to work in. I decided to work on the pathway, which you can see. Um, the structures behind, on the extreme left hand side, are uh, servants' quarters of the people who are working there or helping around in the uh, resort. So they were people who were from smaller villages in Karnataka who had come to Mysore for a better living or to kind of earn well so they could send something back home. Uh, I kind of started relating this to my own life where my parents migrated from Pakistan to India during 1947 without choice and here I was who migrated from Baroda to Bombay with choice for a better living. And uh, I spoke to them and I asked them how do you come in? How do you generally get talking to people? Can I say, well, kya karte hai? Where are your people? How do you communicate? So they said they write letters to their pe people back home. I said, uh, so you're educated? They said, yeah. And I said, why are you working here? They said, we have no choice because you know we, we don't have the experience of office. So people will not give us those kind of jobs. So I decided to write, and I've never written to my parents. I've always spoken to them, or I've always been with them when I'm conversing. So I decided to write a letter on this pathway. And uh, where, uh, you know, along with the help of the gardener from the resort, we, we sculpted the letter into the soil, uh, planted the seeds, ragi seeds, which is a state crop, and uh, often a food for the farmers who kind of leave their farms and come into cities to kind of look for better living. And we planted them and over a period of time the letter grew into a full-fledged uh, letter. And it was a very basic letter and since I had never written to my parents, I actually wrote a letter to my parents asking them, you know, how they were and what's happening with life. Because I moved from Baroda to Bombay. 
So I was speaking to them as if I was not in that space where they were. And I'm somewhere outside and inquiring about my family, friends, happenings. So it was a very basic, simple letter, but a very long, 60 feet long letter because of its character of being in the soil. So um, the idea was to invite people to come and read this letter. Uh, they wrote in, uh, in their own language, but I, I don't know Sindhi, I don't uh, write in Hindi much. So I kind of wrote in the language I knew, and that's the only language I speak with my parents when I'm talking or something. So I decided to write to them in English. And the idea of this letter was it would soon disappear back into the soil. There would be other weeds, you know, which would grow around it, and eventually what, what you would see is the, the text becoming blur or not very shapely. So eventually other weeds grew into it and, 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 and the letter would kind of disappear. So it, it worked really well for me because here was something I've never done in my life. Uh, I've never written to my parents and I don't want them to see this letter because it was, it's not something that I do as a person. And as an artwork it was more like a tribute to the workers who were sitting there and communicating with their families back home. And uh, a simple material like ravi or grass became became like a medium to express this whole idea of migration and uh, identity issue within the urban and the rural. Uh, in 2003, uh, as you all know, Chinese goods had really invaded India, and you could you could see them on the roadside, you could see them everywhere, you could almost beat your own local goods. Um, that time my husband and I, Chintan uh, Upadhyay, we did a collaborative project called Made in China. Um, we decided to buy these objects from the roadside. So there's, there's a pen, there's a raincoat, everything. There was nothing which went below 25 rupees, no, below 10 rupees and more than 200 rupees. So we bought a tent for 200 rupees. So you know, uh, this, this whole invasion of the Chinese goods into the market, whether it was children or uh, housewives or anybody, so it, it was a it was a parallel market which was probably killing your own market somewhere. And uh, the work was more to take on, on that sort of an issue and we covered the entire gallery with these Chinese goods, um, almost like creating a collage on the wall. and. Uh, Somehow each object has its own image uh, and it kind of speak a story of its own to the audience which were coming there. So if we were a kite, it would probably give a story to somebody of a certain generation or an age to, uh, to something which was like a makeup stick. And people are coming and who wants to use a Chinese makeup? And what could people do? You know, for them it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it, it was almost like creating these parallel economies in your own country. And the work kind of was a take on that. Taragi <coughs> uh, has really uh, been a very uh, important uh, visual for me in Mumbai because I think that was one thing I really hadn't encountered when I used to visit Mumbai with my family. And uh, I was living in a house where I had to cross Harabi to go into town to see exhibitions and all. So I would be sitting in a bus and the bus would kind of pass the Harabi. I would get very intrigued because, you know, as an artist you are trained to kind of understand abstract art, uh, art povera, art installation. And I could see every bit of those in this landscape. So for me as an artist it became, how do I, how do I bring this within the framework of a gallery? And I, I decided to put it within the framework of the socio-political and got it into the gallery space. Open for discussion. It's not a it's not a preachy piece or something. It's not about poverty. It's about the landscape and how the migrants have changed the landscape of Mumbai. So it's it's just the fact that it is considered a very lonely uh, area, but uh, it's a most uh, potent. Uh, economic space in, in your city where you know, a lot of the stuff into the city comes from Harabi. So, so I created this uh, 25 by 15 feet large uh, uh, landscape piece with ondulations and all because um, you realize that the squatters have actually climbed the hills as well and uh, so when you have a pan view 
And by then, you know, I had traveled abroad. And I was completely in love with the idea of cleanliness and beauty in the landscape. Uh, and, and kind of coming back into your own city. <coughs> you know, you're kind of looking at elements of what is beauty in Bombay. I think Bombay has an aura, according to me. I don't see anything beautiful about it. But, but if you kind of question that, you know, what are these elements which come into the landscape? If I look at the idea of sublime, it's the urban which is the sublime in Mumbai. It is, it is these tall buildings, you know, which build the skyline and all. So from there started an entire body of work which started dealing with the landscape of the city. And as an artist searching for that beauty or, or romanticism or the sublime in, in the urban landscape. Uh, this work is titled Dream or Wish, Wish a Dream. Um, I uh, actually lifted this title from, um, you know, I used to use fair and lovely uh, cream, like moisturizer. And I bought this packet once in which they have a gold coin offer. And they said, you know, if you buy the cream, you'll get a gold coin. So I kind of started comparing the city with that offer. You know, that if you, if you come to the city, you'll probably become successful. You know, the city has this mental offer to people all the time. And people really feel that if they're in Mumbai, they'll become very successful. So it kind of drew a parallel for me, you know. And hence I just picked up the title and used this. And I hope nobody from Fair and Lovely is listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the title kind of comes from there, the kind of dreams people have, or they aspire to be, or what the city can be for them. And uh, somehow <coughs> the landscapes which I created had a very strong character of squat house, you know, squatters, because they are the people who are constantly moving and developing and changing the landscape. And also, their, their being there is not just an acquisition of space, but it's a strong political motive, a vote bank somewhere, and it's a huge nexus which we all are aware of, and you know what it entails from, from you know, for the city from there. <coughs> Uh, the material used was aluminium sheets, which are often seen in uh, these areas where they build their homes, and especially the doors out of, because that's a material that doesn't corrode easily, and knowing the kind of humidity factor in our city, uh, I decided also to work around with that same material which is used by the squatters. So there's a lot of plastic, there's a lot of rubber, there's a lot of car scrap, there is enamel paint, there is, uh, there's no wood, there is a lot of wire and metal in the world. Um, for me, painting and installation have been going hand in hand. And uh, there's a while, there's a time when I did several paintings together and they stopped suddenly and got into sculpture and then installation. And in 2004 and 5 was a time when I was doing both simultaneously. So the kind of idea spilled from the painting into a sculpture. and. Uh, this was, an, this, this was a thought which uh, actually came when I did the cockroach work. And in 2001, when the Bamiyan Buddhas were destroyed by the Taliban, uh, the entire question of censorship of an artwork or uh, the, the violence attitude to culture in, in, in turn kind of killing an identity of a person or a nation or a religion. So, you know, that, that However, that article was head in my head somewhere and I kind of wanted to deal with it but uh, I didn't know how to deal with it at that time when, when this had happened. And in 2003 I got invited uh, to go to Pakistan for a residency and my forefathers are from Pakistan, we are Sindhis. We migrated during the partition, uh, we were forced to move out. So when I got a chance to go back, my parents were like, are you mad you're going back to Pakistan? Yeah, you know, they, they were really scared that we are allowing a girl to go alone and I had this whole spiel about how I'm an artist and I need to go back to my roots and things of that sort. So my father was like really happy about it. And he actually, at least I feel very bad for him because he actually gave me an address of where he used to live. And it was all Hindu names um, which when I went and actually saw that it was all converted to Muslim names. And I came back and told him, I said, it's now not Rambagh, but it is Arambagh. So things 
things like this, you know, so which, which completely change the identity or the character of the space, much to the political need or the necessity of the time that time. So, because I have my roots in Pakistan and I've never been to Pakistan before, I wanted to make a work where I did not want to use any archival material like photographs of war or uh, post-war. I wanted to create a work which would bring that essence out and yet speak about the violence which was which was kind of covering the area those times, those days. So we could just, you know, when you go for a residency, they often start making you comfortable with the city first. You, you chill for two, three days and you you venture out to the markets, you see what are the cultural spots and you go to markets, you go grocery shopping. So I went to the local market there. And I found in Pakistan, in Karachi, they sell max sticks on a hand car. So you can buy one, one uh, measurement for five rupees, so you get like that many max sticks for one rupee. And this image of a, a car stacked with max sticks was, was a very violent image. You know, like if somebody threw a match at it, it would have just burst it. So it was this walkie-talkie bomb probably in the cities, you know, and that kind of informed my work. So I came back and I ordered these matches and uh, we made the entire work in thousand rupees. But we created these chandeliers which, with matchstick. So I decided to create these chandeliers because the idea was to hang them and let the audience decide whether they wanted to burn it or let it the way it is because it, in a way, puts the question back to you as an individual as to what is your idea of violence and what triggers violence. So, uh, when, when I made these... Uh, when, when I made these matchstick chandeliers, they were done very beautifully. They were like handcrafted and we made that designs and all and everybody would come and ask me, so what are you going to do with these? I said, I don't know, you say. So, somebody said, let's burn them. And you know, there were various reactions to the work and the kind of installation which was there. So, the work probably made you question yourself as to what is your role in, or what is your part in playing towards the violence or creating violence in any aspect of life. So, here I was kind of dealing with the issue of India Pakistan and kind of a volatile relationship we have with them versus a local riot to something which is on the domestic front. So it kind of questions a lot of areas which relate to violence. <coughs> yeah, because I could hang them upside down and uh, you know the idea was that people really thought that there was a performance involved in it. Whereas it's a material which triggers, you know, what you think about it. Like if if when I made the cockroaches, uh, they were made with MC and uh, people really thought that they were real and that was the most thrilling point for me because suddenly the material becomes real for you. Yeah. You know, so the material can actually recreate the real thing for you. Yeah. So uh, when, when we did these, um, they were so beautifully done, they were very filigree and very delicately done that you were like, I'm going to really destroy this thing. And the question goes back also to what happened to the Banyan Buddhas, which, which were an iconography or icon of beauty for a certain religion or ways. So, you know, the question kind of triggers and goes back and forth into these areas of discussion, which, which are probably all around you every day. landscape series, I did around six of them and uh, this one was invited to Mori Museum in Tokyo where uh, they wanted me to encounter the city and Mori Museum is actually on the 53rd floor in Tokyo in this building and uh, when they sent me the site images I decided that's it, I would like to work around this window because uh, it's not a great slide but if you can see, you can see the Tokyo city behind and uh, the work, the window is as, it's the, the top is the top of the work. It's a real big window overlooking the city. And I kind of decided to, to encounter the urban development in my city versus the urban development of Tokyo. 
So when, when, you, when people would enter my space, they would straight away go to the window and start staring at the city, which, which, which is a very sublime character to it, you know, when you, it's, it's an element of landscape which uh, one experiences in Tokyo. So the moment you finish looking at that, you're looking up and you have this huge mobile landscape which you're encountering on a very different level because you know, there are slums, there are buildings, there are tiny lanes, there are narrow lanes. So it's, it's, it's a chaos of two landscapes put in front of you. And uh, it, it very clearly speaks of a very technological, savvy city versus Mumbai, which is kind of you know, under construction all the time. That's a detail of the work. These are very large works, they're like 20 feet by 8 feet. And did you use the aluminium again? Or? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, sometimes you select material, like I don't work with too many ephemeral materials. I, for me, the concept will decide the material. But with this one, I wanted to create that uh, feeling of rickiness or even the fact that this is not permanent somewhere. So the aluminium became like, you know, the real character closer to that. Is it like a real image that you have used or you have just made it from your own mind? No, this is, uh, you know, I have photographs of the city. So you know, I kind of, uh, I'll probably look at a photograph to replicate a particular kind of building. But it won't really be that I'm trying to replicate a certain area in the city. You know, there are a lot of works which I'm not showing you. What I'm actually showing you is these very basic imageries which you see around us. That's why the title of the talk, I See What You See. So these are certain things you've seen around yourself as well. And I've purposely cut out a lot of works which I'm not showing here. And uh, this is, uh, I'll show you in detail when go back. Yeah. These are actually uh, silhouettes of people walking on the road, crossing the roads at the railway stations. Uh, when, as I said, when I came to Mumbai, I used to travel a lot by train and uh, coming to church gate and then walking in that crowd and you know, there's a particular mannerism, there's a particular timetable which everybody follows because if you reach office at a particular time, you have to leave your home at a particular time and board a particular train to reach a particular station at that particular time. So that was amazing and how everybody followed it so diligently, you know, was was fantastic. Uh, this work is about the people of the city, the pedestrian, really. And uh, I usually use my own self in my work, so I would go back and uh, enact these poses, you know. If I would remember somebody, I would go and click a picture of myself and put it aside, then click another one and put it aside. So, for me, I didn't have really a studio space. So the train, the local train became an atelier for me. So I would write down and say this woman, you know, she's, uh, she's kind of holding one uh, the holder with one hand and clutching to her bag with the other. And she's still wearing heels, you know, and she's going to the office. So things, elements like this became a part of my sketchbook and I would kind of go and <coughs> enact them in the studio and uh, clip them. So with this work, I kind of decided to form a pattern. Um, so from far, it looks like a very beautiful decorative pattern, but as you go closer, those figures start appearing and you can see the details of the figures and they're all the working women of Pompeii, or working people of Pompeii somehow. Uh, I was invited to show this work in Dubai and uh, I, the pattern in which I'm showing it was uh, determined by the idea of women in that country. And, you know, this, this pattern is actually taken from a tiger skin, which becomes like a trophy on the wall in most of some of the houses there. And, and uh, it was a very strong comment on the status of a woman that way. And does she remain a trophy over there, or does she really speak up or moves around? So, the work was very provocative in a way. But it was done in such a manner that it looked like a beautiful piece on the wall. But there was this entire story behind it where, you know, how women are treated in Saudi. Uh, they just become trophy wives or they just kind of need to sit there for the idea of beauty. You know, it kind of questions that entire thing.
Um, this is third in the queue for the landscape work. Uh, this one's titled Where the Bees Suck Their Suck Eye. Uh, again, work on the urban development and the urban changes which keep happening. But also an element of greed which kind of comes with that. So it is a land mafia, it is you know, uh, the idea of selling the idea of home to people and the kind of dislocation which takes place in return. So if somebody is getting a home, someone else is getting dislocated from that space which is called home for them. Uh, uh, the work is... Uh, <coughs> the work kind of... Uh, it's a very large work. It's a good 25 feet by... Uh, it's crawling up to like 30 feet if you like. But I'm emphasizing on the size is that when, when the figure, or when a person gets into the world, they really feel surrounded by this debris. So the idea of destruction or the idea of destruction through greed comes across very strongly in this world. And these are all made. Nothing, nothing is ready made, nothing is um, you know, sourced from somewhere. Uh, the, the earth mover was actually created through fiberglass and uh, the structures are again made with aluminium. That's a big thing. This work is titled 8 by 12, which is actually the size of uh, uh, one of the houses in the slums I visited. So this is what contains your kitchen, your toilet, your bedroom, your wall, everything. Uh, the work was uh, created literally into a space of 8 feet by 12 feet where the audience is invited to enter that space and experience the city or the world. Um, I'm sorry for showing this sketch, but uh, this is the only reference I have to show you about this work. Um, when I was working on these landscape works, there were a lot of other elements which were happening close by where it's not just a physical element of the city, but what the city does to you mentally as well. Um, whether it was walking in the narrow lanes or the crowded streets. So there were feelings of, you know, um, a phobia somewhere, or claustrophobia, uh, sort of an insecure feeling. You know, these were certain elements I talked to people about and they were like, I want to leave Bombay and it's too depressing. So you know things, when people talk to you like this, they're not just speaking off their head, there is definitely a reason and they kind of experience something or feel something and they want to, uh, you know, move that way in life. So these three worlds were kind of very much influenced by that thinking where a city which could be a matter of dream for some people is actually a mental asylum for some and for some it's, it's like a jail. So the kind of emotional responses the city evokes was amazing again. So this work was... Um, uh, I picked up these uh, toys from China. You know where this bird goes in circles. It's actually an amusement bird. It's for children or maybe families who enjoy that sort of uh, toy in their house. But the circular movement is, is uh, similar to a movement you find in caged birds and animals in the zoo. And it's called zoophosis, the sort of mental being for them. Uh, that kind of influenced the work again and informed it further away. I was looking at the birds as migratory humans. I was kind of drawing a parallel of migratory birds versus migratory humans. And the feeling of zoophosis for the birds versus the feeling of zoophosis not literally in the zoological sense but um, on a human scale for people who were into the city and wanted to move out. So it, it was like a mental block for them that they, they didn't feel the city worked for them. So the work actually has 50 birds going in circular motion. Uh, it's quite psychotic actually. And then the sound of the machine of the toy, it's really irritating after a while, almost pushing the viewer away from the work. It's a situation you don't want to face in real life as well. So the work kind of got such reactions. Um, this is titled Think Left, Think Right, Think Low, Think Tight. Again, uh, the idea of claustrophobia coming into the city. 
and uh, the kind of cluster figures it emanates. Uh, the work is, uh, is created as an eye, where with a gap of four and a half feet for the viewer to walk in. And uh, as they walk through the work, they can look at the work and kind of experience a certain claustrophobia, around, uh, which is again created by the city for some. It's a long corridor, it's like a 20 feet long corridor, which would invite the viewers to walk through it. Uh, this was last from the series of the landscape where <coughs> but instead of using the 3D structures, I cannot use the rooftops of these structures very symbolically of, of uh, a view of a aerial view of a landscape. Again, very similar to the to the landscape works you see. So the viewer could actually walk in these lines, you know, like they were taking a walk around the city and certain areas in the city. So you were invited to walk around the work, and uh, there was a certain sense of Herculean feeling when when the audience was walking around. You know. Suddenly the city becomes small and you as an individual become really larger than life. Uh, you know, as the city kind of grows on you. Um, this is another work I did in uh, France where I got invited for another residency. Uh, it's a space which actually belongs to Alexander Calder, this actor from America. Uh, this was his holiday home, so he would, when it was really cold, he would come to Europe and do his work there. It's a, it's a beautiful space, you know, surrounded by the forest, and when I got invited, I was there for five months. And I had no clue what I wanted to do, because I really went with a very open mind and no ideas, nothing. Um, so I decided to recreate the forest which was outside in the studio. Uh, so what you see here is actually we screen printed images from copyright free books and created a quasi forest for people to walk in. So it was a good uh, 16, it's a very long piece, like 15 by 16 feet forest and you could walk in the forest. So if I was here and somebody was walking inside, there's almost like a ghostly figure you could kind of see of the person on the other side. And uh, for someone like me who was giving a lot of elements of urban, this was almost like a shock to deal with again and, and this whole question of your proportion versus that of nature and this idea of sublime in nature you know kind of came forth in the work and uh, by, the, by the time one reached the end of the forest the figure almost merged with the trees so you couldn't tell if there was somebody there it was like that close being there only if you come back the same route you'd see the figure emerging now Is this glass? No, it's acrylic, plexiglass and it's screen printed Uh, I recreated this uh, the carpet work once again uh, in another space where we put it on the wall and we allowed the public to take the figure of their choice. So if, if the work was fully there, then you know, somebody would come and take two figures and go away. So by the end of it, uh, the carpet had disappeared. So people had taken these figures and they were using them like bookmarks or like objects of art. And it was almost like acquiring an object of beauty somewhere. And uh, uh, by the end of it, the carpet just disappeared from the wall. Uh, again, related to the bird work, which you saw having a circular movement, uh, what, I've been constantly dealing with migratory birds, which kind of migrate the city for a while and move out again. Uh, this work is titled Princess's Rusted Belt. Uh, Princess was one of the mills, actually one of the earlier mills which closed down in 1960 in Mumbai. And the term rusted belt is a term used for a closed down mill. Uh, and again we have Princess's uh, Queen's necklace. So the idea of Mumbai as a lady or uh, you know, as, a, as a monarchy somewhere 
and the princess and the queen and this whole relationship to the mother and the daughter or the sister or whatever. You know, I was kind of playing around with that idea and how the certain areas are completely neglected. And so the queen is still beautiful with that queen's necklace, but the princess has closed down <laughs> because of the urban, uh, you know, as an urban development uh, proposal or whatever. Um, in a similar manner, I think a lot of people come into the city hoping to live in better areas and having a great life, but they kind of remain on the periphery <laughs> of that idea of great life. And hence, there's a birth of these quarters and you know places like the Arabia or other stars which we see around us. So these were all handmade clay birds. Uh, I didn't make them, but there's a group from Calcutta. They are craftsmen from Calcutta who make these birds. And the clay which is sourced for this work is from the river beds. They use the silt which is on the bank of the rivers to make these toys. For me, so that was a connection to the idea of how migration used to take place in history. Where people would move along, around the river beds so they could have water, they could have fish for eating and they could have their own means of food coming in. So it, kind of, it became very symbolic and, and perfect a piece in terms of material. To to inform my own work on migration and, uh, and the urban uh, transformation. And the text in their mouths is actually sourced from the internet on what the politicians have spoken about the city. And some of them are obviously bragging, some of them are lying, and some of them are just you know, stating what they feel the city should be. So these are all quotations cut and pasted and stuck in the beak of the birds. So the audience could actually go close to the work and see them. So from far they look as if they're twigs for a hole, but they're actually uh, texts which which kind of poke fun at the idea of home. Where <clears throat> I've been going through a personal problem of late, and uh, I usually don't talk much to people about. I mean, I don't have many friends who I go and share with me. Where I live and where I work now, you know, the, the passage has a church which often displays thought of the day. And uh, I was taking the route by default, you know, without realizing. So it's very funny, in the church, just before the church is a signal. So you're about to stop. And you don't know what to do for this one that one minute. Because you're looking around and suddenly I'm kind of looking at this thought of the day. And slowly I start taking that route again because I realized the thought of the day was actually giving me relief in my own personal life. And you know suddenly the, the, the meaning of that sentence was implicating a meaning in my own life. And I started handling situations with that. So, there was, a, there was a thing which was really bothering me and I, I was on that route. And there was a message written, everything is constant but change. So it kind of really, I mean, not that everybody would do that, but for me it was like a mirror show, you know, for a certain problem. And uh, <clears throat> from there came this work where, you know, how we like so busy with our own lives and we kind of move on with our own techniques and uh, roots. And suddenly you have uh, someone who probably has written the same 200 years ago suddenly starts making sense again. So it kind of spoke about the human condition then and now and how you know, words, can, words like this can actually uh, mean much more than their time and space. So these are words which I made with uh, rice. Uh, they're rice grains stuck on paper and uh, rice was very symbolically taken as food. Food sometimes becoming green also. So I was again looking at that element that we, uh, I got in touch with these people who sit outside Jahangir Art Gallery and the right of rice. So I spoke to one of them, I said, you know, I have a project like this and I think you are really trained to write on rice. And uh, when I showed him my project, he was very interested because he said, you know, we do it for earning money and you probably write your name and give it to you. But I'm very interested in doing this project because when I'm reading this, it suddenly starts making sense to me. So it's 
जैसे मुझे आपका प्रोजेक्ट बहुत अच्छा लगा सर आपको मेरा प्रोजेक्ट अच्छा नहीं लगा आपको वो कहावत अच्छी लग रही है क्योंकि आपको समझ में आई आई एम सॉरी यू नो ही सेड आई रियली लाइक योर प्रोजेक्ट सो यू डोंट लाइक माय प्रोजेक्ट यू लाइक द सेम इज व्हिच आर रिटन ऑन दैट पीस सो आई कैन नॉट इन्वॉल्व देम इन माय वर्क एंड दे गो दिस वन सो व्हेन यू व्हेन यू गो क्लोजर टू द वर्क यू कैन सी इट विद एन इंक एंड आई you know it's literally like a lot of things you don't realize in your life but when somebody brings your attention to them you got to look at them more carefully so the work invites that sort of scrutinization in one's for me it was in my life but it could be for the audience you know in a different way so it's really tiny it's invisible to the naked eye so you actually the work is accompanied by <clears throat> it's too magnifying muscle so at the time only two of the audience can come and encounter that work and experience what they have so if you go closer you could actually see the text properly with me so for some it was so text searching spree but for some it was like you know they go back to that sentence read then it is not implicative of anything but it's it implicates a lot because you know the quotations and thoughts which which are probably said generally but they are very universal appeal to them like there are a lot of buddhist sayings in this because i was invited to korea and into a buddhist temple to show this work so i took teachings of buddha and buddha's idea of life and what it can be so this this particular work has all buddhist buddhist teachings by buddha and again how rice was very symbolic to buddha taking his first step to becoming a monk when he went in and asked for food and rice was the first grain he got okay this is the last of the series um <coughs> this was the style of completion of oneself through the other uh, i did this work because i got invited for a sports event in london for olympics in 2012 and uh, <coughs> the work comprises of 11 expressions which uh, i kind of picked up from a sports stadium and uh, they are enacted in a video so i'm the one who is in these pictures and uh, they were made into lenticular prints i'm sure you all know what lenticular prints are you know there was static two dimensional prints when you move they kind of change the form inside and it's it's fun it's, it looks really beautiful And I have collected a lot of them because I was traveling abroad. But Paris has a lot of them, and I have a whole stack of them at home. And I always wanted to make a work with that because I felt it was another kind of a two-dimensional movement, you know, which could, which an audience could experience. You don't need to always make a video because I have never made a video. I don't know how to handle a video in my art. I don't know how to use that language. So I kind of looked at a two-dimensional space again, but yet to create a movement. So. In fact, recently I got invited. Uh, there's a show. I, I must use this time to tell you that uh, there's a show going on at NGMA. Uh, it's a tribute to Sachin Tendulkar, and we are around 12 artists who are invited to be a part of this, where we uh, we all have kind of given our bit about it. So this work got invited for that show. So I, from a small scale, I decided to really make it a big 25 feet by 20 feet uh, two panels. So as you walk in the gallery. You suddenly see these expressions coming to life because when you move from right to left and or back and forth, suddenly these expressions become alive. So these are uh, for me, Sachin Tendulkar was is an icon in uh, sports in, in cricket, but I'm not interested in cricket. You know, I was more interested in seeing what is that iconography that makes him and who makes this iconography for him. And the audience plays a very important role in these sports stadiums. So we, we actually again, you know, selected eleven more expressions and we enacted them. So all these expressions are of happiness, or hope, fear, anger, dismay. You know what what you would see. So I was looking at a lot of videos on YouTube about you know what is the audience reaction to to a sixer or to a someone who's not made any runs. So. It was amazing. I think they were really creating that sportsman on the field, or killing him on the field, literally. So um, Derrida's idea about gaze and how uh, you know the way you look at a person can make him or break him. Literally, that sort of theory, which which is applied to that, was again used to these words. Uh, 
Sorry, that is just to show you the scale of the work. So as you go closer, you suddenly see such in's figures uh, and can he's playing in the foreground. But as you kind of go backward, it, uh, it creates the idea of a stadium behind you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs>